Hey everybody, Coach Jonathan here, and welcome to a very special episode of the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. This week, you'll hear the audio quality sounds very different, uh, and that's because this is a very special episode where we interviewed 11 professional mountain bikers, and we caught them on trains, planes, and automobiles, so forgive the subpar audio quality that we have even for myself here as I'm on site at National Championships, but we interviewed them as they were going to Winter Park, Colorado for Mountain Bike National Championships. It's the course starts at 9,000 feet every lap and just goes up from there. So uh, that's around 3,000 meters. And it's a tall order uh, for a lot of athletes to get prepared for that sort of elevation. But what we did is we asked these athletes the same five questions, every one of them. So what you'll hear is each athlete answering question one, then each athlete answering question two, and so on. And question one is, how did you prepare for the high elevation at Winter Park? Question two is, did you do anything special to prepare for the course? Question three, how did you taper for this race and was it different than a typical taper for you? Question four, what is your nutrition plan for race day? And finally, question five, did you make any equipment choices or unique equipment choices for this race? So enjoy this episode where we get to hear from these professional athletes, all kind of doing some people similar, some people very different uh, approaches to how they prepared for this race. It is a big one and it's one that we can all uh, join in and watch live on USA Cycling's website this weekend and cheer these athletes on. So enjoy this episode, and without further ado, let's start off with these athletes introducing themselves. Hey guys, Russell Finsterwald here. I race for the Cliff Pro team, just getting ready to head up to Winter Park for this year's U.S. National Mountain Bike Championships. Hi, I'm Alexis Scarda, and I ride for Santa Cruz. My name is Alex Wild. I'm a professional mountain bike racer for Orange Seal and Specialized. My name is Hannah Finchamp, and I ride for the Orange Seal Off-Road team. My name's Ryan Standish. I race for Orange Seal Kenda, mountain bike, gravel, a little bit of everything. Hi there, my name is Riley Amos. I'm 19 years old, living in, in Durango, Colorado, and currently riding for the Bear National Team. My name is Spilia Blunk, and I'm a professional cross-country mountain bike racer. This year, my boyfriend Cole and I started our own privateer team. Hi, I'm Cole Patton, and I also am on my own privateer program with my girlfriend, Sevilla Blunk. Our title sponsor is Orange Seal. A big supporter of ours is Pivot and DT Swiss, and we have a lot of other great partners too. My name is Payson McKelvin, and I am a professional mountain biker with the Orange Seal off-road team. My name is Keegan Swenson. I race for Santa Cruz Bicycles here at Winter Park for the national championships. Question one. How did you prepare for the high elevation at Winter Park? So I've took a different approach than what I've done um, in years past when we race at altitude. Um, my parents have a cabin um, outside of Colorado Springs here that's at um, just under 8,500 feet. So I've been up there for the last uh, two and a half weeks, I guess, um, basically living up there. Uh, there's no service, no internet up there. So it's been a, a good like seclusion sort of training camp feel. Um, I've come down to town to do my intervals, which are here in Colorado Springs, we're at about 6,100 feet. So sort of getting a little bit of that train high or sleep high, train low effect. Um, So yeah, really looking forward to seeing how it works out. It's been fun being up in the mountains. So even if it doesn't work out as expected, still a good time, but um, I'm optimistic. So I tried to get up to altitude as much as I could. I live in Grand Junction and the altitude's about like 4,500 and we can ride up to like 6,000 feet. So I tried to get up. Um, we have some areas that are pretty close to us, like on the Mesa and this place called Turkey Flats that get you up to the 9,000 range. And so I would, uh, do a lot of longer rides up there and, uh, make the effort to drive somewhere versus just ride from my house. And, um, I also did a race in winter park two or last weekend, actually, um, to get the feel for what it, what it's going to be like out here next weekend. This year I came up two weeks early, which I guess is the quote-unquote traditional approach to acclimatize. Uh, A little bit different this year, I went up to 9,700 feet, so I've been at Copper for two weeks. So I'll actually, for the first time, go down to Nationals. So Nationals is starting at nine, roughly, I think, and then we climb about 500 feet, so nine to nine and a half. So... The idea there was that the, I guess the altitude that you're at, your body fights to acclimatize to that. And there's some thoughts and ideas that the higher, 
you go, the faster like that first 66% happens kind of thing. So, for example, if I went to Tahoe at 6,000 feet, then I might not ever be acclimatized to nine where nationals is taking place. Um, <clears throat> it was a bit of a risk for me because I had never done such a long time at 9,700 feet and everybody responds differently. But I thought it was an interesting approach and it might pay off. We'll, we'll see. I took a very personalized approach for the elevation because I think there's a lot of ways that you can do it. You know, one strategy is you show up super early and you try and acclimate almost fully. Um, but I find with that strategy, you just can't train hard enough at this high of elevation. And then you also can't recover well enough at this high of elevation. The other strategy is get there right before. I personally find that a little stressful <laughs> because <laughs> you can't, do the course as much as you might want, you know, what if something goes wrong, all that. So I've been lucky enough in my career to race at elevation enough times that I know from my body personally, um, the third day is my worst day. And every day after that, I get better and better and better. So maybe that's also because I do live at about 5,000 feet. So I have just a little bit and so I'm not going from, you know, zero to 10,000 or zero to 9,000. But so the short answer to your question is I will have gotten here one week before race day. Uh, it's been up and down. Excuse that. <laughs> um, I, living in Salt Lake, I kind of would try to get up as high as I could. Kind of did a couple intervals up Empire Pass and Guardsman, which is around, kind of gets you up towards 9,000 feet. Um, not quite starting at 9,000, but um, as close as I could to get some intervals and kind of know what sort of power to, to expect to be able to do um, at this elevation. Well, I'm lucky enough that uh, my home is in Durango, Colorado, which I live at right about almost 7,000 feet of elevation. So that's already a huge bonus for me for sure. But I even notice a difference just going from home to up here at winter park. I even, can feel a pretty big difference. So last couple of weeks, I have just tried to make as many trips higher in the mountains as I can just to do some of my longer endurance rides at altitude. I, I feel like sometimes it can almost be not as beneficial to kind of sleep in your normal bed and then try and train like hard efforts up high because you're actually not like necessarily having enough oxygen for those hard efforts if you're not used to it so i feel like it can almost be more taxing on your body but kind of doing those longer endurance rides up high can help get your body acclimated as long along with excuse me trying to kind of sleep as high as you can so uh me and a couple buddies that were in town in Drano just packed up our trucks and went and slept at like 10 5 for a couple nights to just try and sleep as high as we can because i think that's where the most benefit comes from when trying to adapt to altitude. So trying to sleep as high as you can, um, kind of training your easier days or just longer days at altitude, but really easing into it. You can't really just go all the way in or it's just super taxing for your body all at once. So, yeah. Yeah. So we have been at kind of our home base in Durango, Colorado, um, for the last three weeks. So it's about 6,800 feet here. And we've been just acclimating um, slowly, but yeah, just trying to get as used to it as possible. Um, we've done a couple like high country rides to kind of get our, our uh, bodies used to that super high elevation, but we're sleeping and training around 6,800. So we have a home base here in Durango, Colorado. It's at 6,800 feet. And uh, for me, I'm originally from Washington around sea level. So I, tend to struggle with elevation. Um, so doing a super high training camp, uh, isn't really ideal for me. I need to focus more on recovery. Um, so I'm just trying to get acclimated to my baseline here, uh, in Durango at 6,800. Um, and, and I've really just been focusing more on, on putting in really good training efforts and, uh, sleeping well, fueling well, and, uh, staying away from, from super high elevation. And then we're going to try to get up to Winter Park as close to the race as possible, uh, just so we don't put any more taxing on the system. Well, fortunately, you know, I live at high elevation these days. Growing up as a junior, um, it was always a massive challenge because it seems like 
you know, three out of four national championships, um, USA cycling puts about a high elevation ski resort. So, um, that presents a, a pretty unique challenge for folks that don't live at high elevation. Uh, so throughout my junior years, that was something I, I had to deal with and I would always try to get up, uh, to elevation two or three weeks beforehand. Um, and actually that's what eventually brought me to Durango, Colorado. Um, I came to Colorado or Durango for a pre-nationals acclimation camp and fell in love with the town. But nowadays I'm lucky enough to live here. So, um, acclimation just, uh, comes naturally by, by, uh, virtue of living where I do. We actually live, um, about 1200 feet above Durango also. So I'm at about 7,700 feet elevation, um, used to live down at 6,500, but those extra 1200 feet or so, you know, theoretically do make a, a significant difference. Um, and even though it's, even that is quite a bit lower than winter park. Um, I think I'll be in a bit better position than, um, a lot of folks that are coming from lower elevation. I, mean, I just kind of did my regular program. I hung out at my home in Heber for, I was there for a solid four weeks with a race in Vail before that up at like 8,500 feet as well. Um, and yeah, just knocked out a solid few weeks of training and didn't really do anything too specific. Question two, did you do anything special to prepare for the course? A little bit. Uh, it's kind of advantageous that we raced uh, more or less the same course in 2019. Um, so sort of uh, my coach and I, Jim Lehman, we've been tailoring our um, intervals to sort of match the demands of what the course in Winter Park brings. Um, so a lot of like eight to 10 minute intervals, just trying to build that um, upper threshold power, short recovery times since the downhills are pretty fast. Um, so just as replicating the course as much as possible. Um, it's kind of unique right now. We haven't had, um, races in a while and there's not any huge or super important races on the timeline. So it's been just really ideal to hundred percent focus in on this race and, um, do everything as po- best as possible for it. Well, the desert is a really different style of riding compared to like riding up in the mountains. But, uh, again, I would say, uh, just getting up to places like Tepiki Flats and the Mesa is very similar riding. And then, uh, doing that race in winter park last weekend, Mm -hmm. uh, to get the feel for the roots again and getting close to trees and not hitting your handlebars and, and just preparing in that way. Nationals is a big goal for me. So my coach actually built a workout specifically for this course. Um, we worked our way up to four rounds of what was five minutes at, I think it was like 110% of FTP, and then two minutes of quote unquote rest, which was just high zone two. So I'd say 65, 70% of FTP, and then 10 minutes at FTP, and then between sets, five minutes of endurance, so like low endurance. So 55 to 60 percent of ftp and then that block which i hope everybody can follow in their head of 22 minutes is repeated four times to try to mimic the demands of the course and then to really just crush my soul we have 30 minutes of tempo after that and then 30 second sprints with one minute rest have a big star next to this one and it's a course that suits me and not not to say I'm getting old, but XC may not be my entire focus moving forward. And it's a course that suits me. And I've never won a national title, so I kind of just I put all the put all the eggs towards it and and kind of full full gas. I think my strategy. So I do a lot of climbing in general, which I feel like that's probably the main element of this course is it's a climb and descend. It's a long lap. Um, so nothing really particular for this course, uh, more just particular for this race. I think it's really important for me to do very race specific type of efforts. And by that, I mean, a lot of changes in pace, Um, because in training, we tend to do these very specific intervals, but on race day, it's a little more staccato. You don't get to pick when you go hard and when you don't go hard. Um, so I've been working a lot on, uh, trying to force myself to, to, to go hard, maybe when I don't want to, and, and to change it up a lot. Not, well, I spent a little more time on my mountain bike (laughs) having done, uh, a lot of, or a bit more gravel focused. Uh, going into uh, into unbound earlier this year um so i've tried to 
get some skills back on the mountain bike. But for the the course specifically this weekend, I've been doing more um, like there's a seven between seven and eight minute climb. So I've been doing a lot of threshold and then sort of five minute attempted VO2 um, intervals with sort of like five minutes VO2 with five minutes recovery in between sort of replicating what the lap might look like for yeah doing that and then a few few over unders but nothing I guess more trying to get that short shorter higher power um, than what you need for the long gravel races not necessarily uh, I kind of I just got back from Europe racing world cups actually so kind of mostly just tried to get acclimated at home and kind of had a bit of a season reset kind of trying to focus on a little bit later in the season for some later world cups and world champs so i'm kind of just really focusing my training around that just kind of got back into some big hours coming into nats but always always for a race it's important like nats backing off a little bit in the, the week before letting your body recover from all the hard training you've been doing and then just some some small hard effort opener workouts during the week before my race to kind of get that body get the body transferred over from just long hours training to get a little bit of that snap back for uh, the actual xc race we've just been riding our mountain bikes a ton i think the course isn't super technical um it's kind of a unique cross-country course compared to what we are used to it's just like one super long climb and then a long descent um so yeah just trying to get super used to our mountain bikes um i am bringing planning on racing my hardtail but that could change um so yeah it's really not that technical of a course um you know it's compared to like some of the world cups earlier this season or even like the Fayetteville us cup it's pretty mellow um really i've just been riding my mountain bike a ton and i think that's that's the best preparation that that you could really do is just being super used to that position and how you feel on your bike um i'm racing my full suspension so i've been doing all of my intervals on my full suspension and uh just trying to get as much time as i can not really um as we kind of alluded to earlier, this, this cross country nationals is almost more for me than for uh, a team or sponsors per se. And, and by that, I mean, I'm doing it just cause I want to, you know, it's not, it's not a mandated race for me. Um, I don't know that, you know, people are expecting me to come out and, and, you know, be charging at the front and, and battling for the win the whole time, just based on what I've been focusing the last few years. Um, but I really do love cross country racing still, even though my, my focus has shifted a little bit in the past years and, um, I've missed it some. And so while it's a little bit non traditional, maybe to have your first XCO race back be the national championships, um, I, I couldn't really look myself in the mirror and, and miss it. So, um, I'm, I'm really excited to be back. And, and I say all that to say, I, I can't really afford to change my training too, too much. Um, because I do have other events that have expectation from team and sponsors that are a little bit more of a focus, but fortunately this nationals course is, uh, quite climb heavy and not terribly technical and at elevation. And so more of the threshold sub threshold style training that I focus on anyway, uh, for my longer distance stuff should carry over, uh, more effectively than, maybe more European style XCO, which is obviously a lot punchier sea level uh, VO2 efforts over and over. So no, actually not really. I, mean, I know the course has like a eight, 10 minute climb and that's the bulk of it. But I think for me, I respond well to just kind of big volume training and like aerobic fitness is aerobic fitness. And it's uh, up here at altitude. That's kind of the name of the game, I think. And I think you can get, if you get too detailed, you can get like kind of stuck too into the course and like, focus too much on those efforts and it's better just to like just to train you know not not look too deep into it question three how did you taper for this race and was it different than a typical taper for you definitely been tapering a little bit um i wouldn't say i do like a full-on um taper as what would define a true taper um but definitely going into this race fresh i would say um still 
doing intervals to stay sharp, um, still riding pretty hard the weeks leading into the event and um, even the few days before. Um, so definitely like trying to be as fresh as possible on race day, but not doing like a full on true taper. I find for me, just kind of keeping the engine running hot a little bit seems to work best for me. So yeah. <laughs> this whole season's kind of made up of a lot of little tapers and then you have like your main key race and that's kind of a bigger taper. And I would say that nationals is the biggest race for me. And so I had like, not as as intense of a block before this race and I had more recovery. So just trying to get as fresh as I can. Um, so yeah, I would say that this is my, my key race. So bigger awesome. taper. I'd say it's different in terms of it being a big race. So we're okay losing a little fitness to be a little fresher for it. Um, I've always worked better kind of having load. So like we're chatting the Tuesday before the event. So I had my last like big interval day last Wednesday, and then we're doing accelerations, like just little 45 second bursts to kind of keep the engine going this week and over the weekend. And then we'll kind of roll into national. So it's a bigger taper than I would usually take. Um, I wouldn't say it's a taper in the traditional form just with how my body works, but definitely more focus on this race and the next one after it is Leadville that has a big circle around it. So we kind of have room to kind of let the fitness drop and build it back up for Leadville. So we did. It is a little bit. Um, and for a variety of reasons. So the first is usually nationals is kind of that first huge a race of the season. Um, maybe the only a race, maybe of one other for me, that's a little different this year because I was on the Olympic long team. So I went to the world cups and I got to race, um, in those final races that would count towards Olympic qualifications. So that was an a race for me already this year. And now eight weeks later, I have this other A race, which is a little bit close to have two A races. So I had to get a little creative. Um, and so for me, my taper this year is I've been going harder, um, working a lot harder for longer, and then it's going to be a more aggressive taper. So I really started my taper one week out rather than maybe a little more gradual. Um, and that also works out well because I got here one week before. And so it, I won't be pushing myself very hard at this elevation, mostly just focusing on recovering and resting and getting ready for race day. Uh, definitely different than usual. This is going to be, I think, my sixth week racing in a row, including Unbound and a couple XC races. Um, so I actually took some time off maybe two weeks ago, took like four days to kind of try and reset with, with this being the focus. And then built into, I did Firecracker 50 on Sunday as kind of in a way trying to replicate doing unbound and then the Missoula pro XCT. Cause I had a really good ride in Missoula after going super deep for unbound. So I kind of tried to replicate that a little bit, doing a longer race seven days out and then yeah, take it pretty easy this week. I've got a hard ride today on Wednesday and then easy tomorrow. And then a little opener workout on Friday before the race. So, I guess a pretty standard taper for this week, but as far as the preparation three weeks out was probably a little different than usual. Uh, yes, it definitely was a different taper just cause I said like my, my goals kind of right now are later in the season. So definitely not tapering as much as usual for this race. I mean, last week was still just doing some really big hours. Sunday had a huge workout and then Monday had an easy day. And then just like some, like some easy rides mixed with like some short interval workouts. Like today I'm going to do a little short one minute efforts on course, but definitely didn't taper as much for, for a world cup peak event. I'll come from some really hard training and really kind of 10 days out, start the process of easing out tapering. But for national champs this year, it's a, it's obviously a huge goal, but for me, my bigger goals are later in the season. So kind of using this to, to train through a bit, definitely easing off my, my schedule a little bit, because obviously it's a huge, 
huge race, still a big deal, but with the goal of kind of using it to train through for some, some larger goals in the season later. I would say my taper for this race has been um, bigger than regular tapers. And I think that's just because um, a lot of the races we do like leading up to this are more training races. Um, and this is just kind of a, a more important one to target. So we've really been um, tapering hard for this one, I'd say. Quite a bit, actually. This is one of my key events for the year, as it is for most mountain bikers. Um, I, I really haven't done many structured interval sessions in the last three weeks. I've been using kind of mock races as my intensity instead. So like what's awesome here in Durango is we have like weekly short tracks or even weekly cross country races. Tuesday night worlds is like a really fast road ride. Um, so I've been doing those instead of structured intervals just to get my intensity. And I'm, I'm only doing, you know, I'm doing really short, like intensity, like maybe 40 minutes at a time. Um, probably the last three weeks really. So I've been taking it pretty easy. My weeks are like 12 to 14 hours. Um, and, and just really trying to focus on recovery up here at elevation again, because it's super easy to dig yourself into a hole. Kind of, um, yeah, to an extent, I guess, you know, I, th I think, uh, people have different perspectives about tapering, um, when at least from my perspective and you get to the professional level, um, there are so many important races that it's quite hard to really peak for a certain one. I think uh, an exception to that might be obviously the folks that are going to the Olympics or uh, racing the world championships, that sort of thing. Um, but I have the Belgian waffle ride the weekend after cross country nationals. And um, you know, if you ask my team, they probably are more interested in me getting a result at BWR than at XC nationals this year. So um, I just try to be, good all the time and then uh sort of prioritize a and b races so um there are races that i will more aggressively quote unquote train through um but over the years i've kind of found that i actually do better with longer periods of focus training rather than using a bunch of racing to get fit so i tend to have better form if i can just kind of uh mind my own business, put blinders on and, and train uninterrupted for five weeks or so. So I'm actually racing a little bit less these days, but, um, how would I put it? Well, I guess I'm, I'll do like a 14 or 15 hour week this week, um, which is less than I typically would, but I'll do like a 12 or 13 hour week, the week after going to Belgium waffle. So I guess you could call it a taper, but, not like a true, you know, 100% all-in type taper, if that makes sense. Not a ton. I did have a bit of a rest week last week, and then we started to roll back into it uh, this past weekend with a pretty hard motor pace session and a bit of sweet spot work. Uh, I think I can't – I like to taper a little further out and then build – kind of get the legs rolling early in the week. And this week, I'll really just – it's a lot of, like, two-hour workouts with some sweet spot and tempo. Um, so I guess I tapered a little differently than like I would for, like, a sea level race, just in the sense that – I don't need to, the legs don't need to be quite as fresh, if that makes sense. But the body itself needs to just be like generally recovered, but still stay open. It's kind of like that. It's a bit of a fine line for me. I've found like, you don't want to taper too much. Otherwise the engine starts to shut down and you just don't feel as good. So I guess I did taper differently, but just uh, a little bit further out, a, lo a longer, more gradual taper, I guess. That makes sense. Question four. What is your nutrition plan for race day? For race day, I'll probably stick to more or less my normal cross-country nutrition strategy. Um, I'll race with cliff blocks in my pocket. I'll probably have a whole package warming up just to get some electrolytes before the start. Um, and typically, I race with two block packs. Uh, I'll probably only eat one and a half of them, um, but just always have a little extra. It's better to have too much than not enough. Um, and then drink wise, I tend to stick with water. It's easier on my stomach, but I will have, um, some sort of electrolyte mix the, um, in the middle of the race, just to get through it, get some sugar in you. Say having a normal breakfast, which is usually pancakes and yogurt. And then, um, I like to eat three hours before an event. So I'll have, uh, probably rice and eggs and maybe toast that's anything that's like easy on the stomach <laughs> so hard to eat before race 
mm-hmm. uh, and just try to get in as many calories as I can because typically when you're nervous, you feel nauseous. <laughs> so it's hard mm-hmm. to get those calories down. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, and then um, during the race, I'm going to try and eat a gel like every 20 minutes or so. During the warm up, I'll probably just pedal around for 20 minutes and I'll sip on a a scratch mix just to get some sodium in, some carbs, maybe take a gel. And then each lap I will have in the feed zone a SIS electrolyte gel, which is 22 grams of carbs, I think. And then a bottle half full of scratch hydration mix um, just to keep topped up on electrolytes. Um, Hydration is a big factor at altitude and you can, (coughs) excuse me, you can get dehydrated a little easier. So I was focusing on electrolytes and still shooting for 80 to 100 grams of carbs per hour. Um, I'll, I'll go by feel on whether I'll carry that bottle. I'll have it half full in the feed zone. Um, the plan going in is probably just to chug as much of that as possible through the feed zone stretch and chuck it. It's a long eight-minute climb to start every lap. And after that, there's not really much room to drink anyway. So... We're doing roughly 20-ish, low 20-minute laps. So that's that would be enough fluids for me. Carbs. <laughs> Just <laughs> eating lots of carbs. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because this is a long lap. Uh, so it's a little bit different than a lot of the times we're getting um, a nutrition hand up, you know, maybe every eight minutes or less. So this time we might not be getting hand ups more than every 25 minutes. So I think I'm going to focus a little bit more on drink mix, um, than I typically do. And then I'll supplement that also with some standard goo gels and of course, uh, pancakes before the race. So, you know, at altitude, you, you can, your body can utilize those carbohydrates or it, it uses up more carbohydrates. So really just having that in my mind and knowing, Like, Hey, I need to be on top of this, whether I want to or not, because that nutritional, um, or that hunger response is diminished as well. So really being intellectual rather than, uh, listening to my body. (laughs) I don't have anything super structured for the whole day, but we ride our races at 5 30 PM. So kind of have the whole day to, to eat, (laughs) um, breakfast, probably, probably oatmeal um, kind of do that. And then maybe pancakes for lunch. I don't know. And then a big, I'm going to say probably go like rice and eggs for a late lunch around two thirty, three 3 o'clock. And then coming into the race, I'll usually like during my warm up or just leading into it, we'll go through a, a pack of, or a sleeve of chews kind of just take two, two of those at a time and through that hour leading into the race. And then, then we'll do a, a gel 15 or 20 minutes before kind of once I finish that, finish the warm up, um, just to top off any carbs there. And then during the race, I'm shooting for about 75 grams of carb per hour. So mixing that, that's kind of looks like about, 55 from drink mix. I'm using the Carbo Rocket 333 or Half Evil stuff, which is like 100, it's like 20 or 25 grams of carb per scoop. And then I mix that with their lighter, two scoops of that, and then one of their lighter drink mix, which is flavored. So I do the unflavored mix and then put one small scoop to give it a little flavor. Um, and then one gel probably a gel going into lap two and then one going into lap four just to keep things topped off. Um, and I'll do, I think we're going to do five laps. I don't know a hundred percent, but they're about 20 minute laps from looking at, uh, two years ago. So look at doing about half a bottle per lap, um, and try and finish that, like drink that as quick as I can because, doing eight minutes at LT VO2 is not super conducive to getting, getting anything down. So try and get as much through, through the feed zone 
um, where it's flat and then, um, then be able to climb from there. Um, I've actually been experimenting with that a little bit recently cause I've actually been having some stomach issues earlier this year at some of the world cup races, but I'll have a, a big dinner night for kind of as much as I can eat. Usually some car carb heavy protein heavy, definitely some, some veggies, but not a ton of veggies because they kind of stick around in your system and are harder to digest. Um, but still just a pretty balanced, normal night before meal. I'm not super picky about what I have night before, like a lot of people are, but morning of the race, it depends on when I'm racing. If it's an afternoon race, I'll eat fairly normal breakfast in the morning. If it's like if I'm racing later in the afternoon, and then two and a half hours before, I'll just have a bowl of uh, just some white rice with a little olive oil, a little salt, and and then that's it. I'll have maybe a, a goo 15, 20 minutes for a start, but that two and a half hour mark, I'll have that just small meal, um, kind of that pre-race meal. But yeah, up here altitude, your body's burning through carbs a lot faster than normally. So I'll be running mix in all my bottles, uh, high sugars, high carbs in all my bottles. And then probably about every 30 minutes supplementing that also with the gel. It is the same as always. Um, I'm not changing anything for this. I don't like to change anything on race day. Um, but I think for this race, especially it's going to be super important for hydration and just like throughout the week and on race day, um, and not just water, like making sure you're taking in those electrolytes at, at that elevation. Like it's super important. So, um, one thing I learned in Puerto Rico when we were there for Pan Am champs, um, earlier this year, it's super hot there and we discovered, uh, Pedialyte Otter Pops. So I'm going to try to find some of those and, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, all of us have our, our routines, but mine is, uh, rice and eggs the night before. Um, it, it's just super easy to digest and it's, it's a good source of carbohydrate. Um, the morning of pancakes, I'm, I'm on the bandwagon. Um, I use Bob's red mill. Um, and then since we race in the afternoon, I'll do pancakes again at lunch. Um, and then for, for caffeine, for caffeine leading up to the race, I'm actually using run gum, uh, their extra strength, 200 milligrams of caffeine. And then I warm up with 12 ounces of Red Bull. That's like the perfect amount of carbohydrate and caffeine on top of that for me. Um, starting the race, uh, I do cis gel every 20 minutes and I'll probably have hammer fizz electrolyte tabs in my bottles. Um, and that's kind of my go-to for XCO events. Yeah. Um, instead of taking some solid foods, it'll be a hundred percent gels and uh, hydration mix, um, for, you know, a 90 minute out, eh, it might be, it might be a hundred minute. Um, I think this race was a little bit longer last go around, but, um, probably two or three gels and some hydration mixes. Uh, is what it will come down to a uh, bit of caffeine in there about halfway through and uh, probably just water on the last lap or two. And you, it's more about like refreshing the mouth and maybe spraying down your neck rather than hydration at that point. Probably do like half bottles every lap. It seems, my guess is we'll do six laps or so. Um, so I think that way you're not carrying a full bottle that climb every time. And you have the goal of getting the feed zone with an empty bottle. And that way you could chuck the bottle, get a fresh one, your lid's clean. It's not, the water's not hot. Um, that's normally kind of my go-to strategy. And sometimes I'll tape gels to the bottle. Sometimes it's in my pocket. It just kind of depends on where I want to eat the goo. Um, but yeah, pretty, pretty simple. Question five. Did you make any unique equipment choices for this race? I haven't ridden the course yet. I'm going up there tomorrow and my first laps will be tomorrow evening. So I'll probably um, make all my equipment decisions after getting a few laps on there. Um, the things I would look at, look into changing are probably my tires. I'm still undecided if I'm going to run 2.4 Aspens or 225 Aspens or a combo of 2.4 in the front, 225 in the back. Um, so that'll most likely be the equipment I change. Um, I'm 75% leaning towards running a dropper, 25% towards 
possibly pulling it off. So we'll kind of see there. I'm a big fan of the dropper, so it'll it'll probably be on there on race day. But got to look at all the options. Got to pull out all the stops. <laughs> Things special as far as the geometry and the bike setup. However, I'm racing uh, the salmon colored frame, so I switched to the colored frame versus the black frame just for fun at nationals. Uh, and I had to swap some parts over so I could get my hardtail set up for actually short track. So uh, I'm, I am going to race the full suspension for cross country, but um, still debating on a dropper. I might play around with that idea this week, whether or not to use it. <laughs> Nothing crazy or different than other races. Um, I'll run my ice friction chain, which I run at all races. Um, recently specialized has released new tires. So I've actually swap the tires i'll use but not for this race but just because of testing that i've done on the new compounds and treads so i've moved from the old fast track 2.3 controls to the new renegade 2.35 t5 controls as like my go-to tire so i'll race those on race day but it's not specifically for this race more just the timing of when those tires were released is is in line with this race I didn't change anything um, compared to what I normally do, but I am really excited for this year in particular because in 2019, uh, the course was basically the same and it was really kind of on the brink, I feel, between a hardtail and a full suspension course. We saw both bikes out there. Both bikes were highly successful. And so I, I raced a hardtail in 2019 and even coming back this year, it's like, oh, I don't know you know, which one I would pick. But now that I have the Trek Super Cal, I really feel like I have that kind of perfect in between um, because it is so light and I think it'll climb really, really well. But I have that extra suspension for that kind of Rudy section and all those extra bumps up top. Um, Not yet. I'm still, I'm going to try and get out for a lap today or, or early tomorrow on I've got the full suspension and the hardtail, so that'll just be um, deciding which one will be the best choice for for this race. Which I think, even though it is a super long climb, there's a traversy section that's pretty rough. So I'm leaning towards the full suspension at the moment, um, just to be a little more efficient pedaling across the the rough stuff um, without too much weight penalty for the climb, like the full suspension still, still pretty dang light. Not necessarily. I kind of just, I, this is my third year racing on my Trek super caliber. So I'm super familiar with the bike. Uh, I've been running, uh, Maxis recon race tires all year, two, three, fives. I'm pretty happy with those here as well. Um, so I'm not really changing tires up unless it's going to get super muddy, but I think I'm going to run a dropper post as well. Sometimes I go back and forth, but I've just been racing the dropper all year. So it takes me some time to get used to riding the high post again. And I just haven't done that. So honestly, my bike's going to stay pretty same as it's always been, you know, I might tinker with suspension a bit, tire pressure a bit, always, um, course to course. Cause it's pretty dusty up the, out there and you're always trying to go as low as you can in tire pressure without burping or pinching just to try and get the most grip possible. So we'll find out what that number is as we ride this week and tinker a bit. But yeah, other than that, really no, nothing special out of the ordinary that I'd be changing for a race like Nats. The biggest one is, is racing my hardtail. I, I've raced my full suspension at most of the events this year. So um, yeah, just been, putting a lot of time in on the hardtail, getting super used to riding all kinds of terrain on that um, to make sure I'm super comfortable. Uh, I did it, but Sevilla did. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, yeah, it, we're, it's an inside joke. She's racing her hardtail. I'm racing my full sus. And uh, I think she's uh, second guessing herself or she was today, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> no, no, my, my full suspension, I'm on the pivot Mach four. And that thing is just so reliable for me. I, I rarely race my hardtail, you know, I'll only race it for short track. And, uh, yeah, the, the full suspension bikes now are so light. It's, it's not worth it for me to use anything else. So I'm using that with a dropper post. Um, I am running a tire noodle in the rear. Uh, I've been going back and forth on running, um, 
in both the front and rear, but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm being a weight weenie. I hope I don't regret it, but, uh, I'm only putting one in the rear. So we'll see. <laughs> Not well, I'm, I'm running my typical cross country. The reason I pause is because I'm running my traditional cross country setup, but the way I've been training and riding on my mountain bike for the last year plus is a little bit more trail oriented. I've really been enjoying doing high mountain, a little bit longer distance rides, um, sort of some adventure rides, but you know, burlier kind of more raw terrain. And for that reason, I've been running a little bit wider tires and riding my top fuel. Um, but I've been spending a lot of time on my super caliber the last three weeks. Um, just getting really familiarized with that platform, shorter travel platform. And I threw some, uh, two, two, five Maxis Aspens on, um, which have been my go-to race tire and a lot of people's go-to race tire for several years now. Um, and at first it was a little bit of a shock to the system. Um, not so much the, the tread pattern, but just the lower tire volume. Cause I had been riding two, three, five or two, four pretty much exclusively. Um, but it clicked back pretty quickly and it's amazing once you recalibrate to, handling of a short travel bike and a little bit narrow tires, how you can ride just about as aggressively. Um, and so it was actually really fun to, to get back in touch with that, um, cross country style setup and it feels so fast going uphill. So it's going to be fun ripping around winter park and, uh, you know, searching for every last little second round each turn. Um, but yeah, just kind of getting back to that super, weight oriented rolling resistance oriented xc minded bike setup is is the change i made the last few weeks just running my uh my santa cruz blur with uh let's see 36 to chain ring 2.4 aspens i'm still like kind of on the fence about the dropper probably going to run the high post but it's like need to kind of nail that down um otherwise that's my basic setup i don't really vary too much from that i think this course even though it's a long smooth climb there's still some rough sections down low that I think you, the race isn't necessarily won there, but it can be lost there. And I think the full suspension's hard to beat. Thanks for tuning in to this special episode of the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast. If you enjoyed this sort of episode, let us know. We'd be happy to get more pro athletes sharing what they're doing to prepare for races and giving you insights on their training. And as a reminder, you can go to USA Cycling's website and watch these races this weekend and cheer these riders on. And also, as always, if you want to become a faster cyclist, head over to trainerroad.com. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you next time.